everybody! Hello, oh, these are my hands. It's the Fat Squirrel. Um, this is not a normal podcast. I'm going to talk a little bit about speaking, so this is a bonus episode. Jazz hands for bonus episodes. Um, and that is all thanks to the Patreon and PayPal supporters of the podcast. Yay, y'all! So, not a normal podcast. I'm going to talk about steaking. Um, so a lot of folks have asked over uh, recently, but also just over the time I've been doing the podcast, if I will talk about how I steak. Um, so what I'm going to do today is work through the process of my Ishnana. Is that right? Now I suddenly can't remember what the sweater's called. Um, it's by Isol Teague. <laughs> this is Quince and Company Finch in the Carrie's Yellow colorway. The pattern is not written to be steaked. The pattern is just written as a flat. You knit one piece to the armpit, um, and then you separate, divide off the front and the back stitches, and then knit the rest. But because it's a fingering weight sweater, and I am a big lady, that's a lot of purling to do. And I am not a very efficient purler. My knitting style is um, such that my purling is much slower than my knitting. So what I'm going to do, what I've decided, or what I decided to do, is to steak the sweater. So Obviously, you have to decide that before you cast on, or very shortly thereafter. Like, very shortly. <laughs> um, and so, how I do that is, for example, um, this pattern that is not written to be steaked, um, you just, you would just modify it as you would normally to knit in the round. However, you just want to add a number of steaking stitches. So, it depends kind of on the... Um, weight of your yarn, but a general rule of thumb is six stitches, three on each side of the cutting line is kind of the general rule. And you just want them to be knit. You do not want them, see how the purling, the ribbing, sorry, I'm trying to get used to how the, the camera is working here. Um, so this is where I'm going to be cutting right through here. And you'll see that that's just all stocking at, I've changed the, you know, I just broke up the rib so that it would be all stocking at. Um, it's a little bit strange when you do, for example, um, sleeves. So what you do when you have a sleeve, here, I'll lay it out like it actually. There we go. So you bind off, so usually you, most sweaters, oh, this sweater has an inset sleeve. So it depends on the style of sleeve you have. Um, a set in sleeve. But it's basically the same for all other, all sleeves. Typically, I mean 99% of the time, your pattern is going to have you bind off stitches for the underarm. Right? So you bind those off, and then on the next row, you're going to basically cast on your steak stitches for that, for that cut. Right? So let's say I bound off, I don't remember how many it is, but say, I think it's about 10. So maybe so each for each side, front and back. Um, so let's say I bound off 20 stitches. I don't cast on the same amount. I cast on my six steak stitches up here in the next row. Okay. And sometimes there's a bit of finagling about like, again, if a pattern is written flat and you knitted back and forth and you're, you're going into the round, you know, you're going to have to do a little bit of finagling with right side, wrong side rows. Um, obviously it's just straight stock in it. It doesn't matter, but this one does have um, a texture pattern to it, a lace pattern to it. So just be aware, be confident. You're not gonna hurt something. <laughs> you know what I mean? In terms of like a right side, wrong side row. Um, you just, you just think about it. Just be aware of what you're doing. Um, so you cast that on and then you just decrease as you normally would for the pattern. Okay. And so this pattern is written um, with a sewn shoulder seam. If it were in fact something where I did like a three needle bind off or something, I would not do that before I cut the steak because it's just too, I mean you can, but it makes me a little bit nervous. So for example, this is a sewn shoulder seam and I will just leave it unsewn until I cut this steak. I will then sew the shoulder seam before I pick up stitches for the armhole, if that makes sense. Um, similarly, when you're doing a neckline, so for example, this pattern was written to be knit 
without decreases or anything until here. And then you bind off for the neck opening, for the neckline. So you can see I bound off, I don't know, 30 stitches or something like that. And then again, cast on those six sticks, those six steak stitches as you're doing your decreases for the remainder of the collar. You can see how this is laying funny. That's because this collar is actually decreasing so that when I cut this, it's going to open up to be more like this. But because these steak stitches are still closed, it's pulling together like that. So something to be aware of, for example, in this pattern, there's lace along this side. Now, be aware, this is a pretty small eyelet because it's fingering weight, but just be aware that when I cut this open, and um, essentially what you do is you cut it open and fold it back. So there may be a slight overlap so that I have some fabric behind these stitches. That does not bother me. But if it's something that would bother you, then that's probably not a choice you want to make. Does that make sense? So again, I'm going to cut this open and you'll see later, I'll show you how I pick up stitches and everything. It's actually going to be folded back. And you will, especially if you're not tidy or if you're wanting to add like a ribbon, some people add a ribbon um, on those stitches. You just be aware that that's going to show through if you do have any yarn overs or anything like that. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is do the preparations for the machine sewing. How I do my steaks is I machine sew, so I machine reinforce the stitches and then cut. So I'm going to machine reinforce on both sides and then cut them open. Um, there's definitely different methods you can do if you don't want to use a sewing machine. You can do you hand sew them. I, that was the first project I ever did um, that had a steak in it. It was actually my second ever actual project, <laughs> which was a fair isle vest for my grandfather, which had steaked armholes and a neck hole. Um, and I just hand, I just used hand sewing like an over, like a back, I think I used like a back stitch or something, but you're just trying to catch this, this, the yarn of each stitch so that it's not going to unravel. Um, so whatever works best for you, you can do like kind of like a zigzag or whatever works for you. Um, so that you're catching those stitches. You can also use, um, you can also crochet to be your reinforce, like a single crochet along either side of the cut line. I've done that as well. That works really well. Um, the only thing I don't like about that I don't, so that I don't use it more often, I do enjoy that it's very easy. You can do it while you're sitting and watching television or whatever. You don't have to make a special time to do it um, like you do if you're doing a sewing machine project. Um, but the reason I don't do it very often is it's bulky. Like you can, you can, you know, single crochet is a rather bulky stitch. Almost all crochet stitches are because they are like basically knotted stitches. So, sorry, I'm drinking as I talk to you, not drinking alcohol, drinking bubbly. <laughs> So the reason I don't use the crochet reinforcement very often is it, is it gets bulky, especially on heavier sweaters. Um, you can use a finer yarn. For example, if you're doing a worsted weight sweater, you can certainly do your crochet reinforcement with fingering weight yarn, um, but just, just something to be aware of. Um, so I do prefer to do the sewing machine method. It's probably because I have sewing machines out in my house pretty often because of I run a sewing business for a living. So that's kind of a hurdle that I don't have to overcome. I understand that when you are not, a, you know, when you don't have a sewing machine out regularly, it's such a hurdle to get over to get that machine out and get it set up and make sure everything's working. So I get it. Like that's a great reason to use a crochet reinforcement or again, to use a hand sewing technique. Um, and you can certainly find information about those online. But what I'm gonna show you today is machine sewing. So the very first thing I am going to do is something just to help me out. Um, when you're, um, you don't need to do this at all if you are doing a hand sewing technique or if you're doing um, a crochet reinforcement because you're gonna have eyes directly on your stitches. It's not confusing visually. However, when you are using a sewing machine, it's, it's much harder to stay online, even though I'm very experienced with a machine. 
it's just harder to stay on that one stitch line. And when I say stitch, I mean knitting stitch than it is if you're like doing something by hand. So what I, sorry, I've had a needle out and suddenly it has disappeared into the ether. So we get another sewing needle. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's, so this is a technique I use. I'm sure that it's, you know, I'm sure I learned it from somewhere else, but it is just helpful when you're machine sewing to um, create a contrast line for your eye so you can see exactly where the steak divides. Um, so what I do is just, you can use a piece of embroidery floss. You don't want to use sewing thread because it's just too fine. Um, but you can use sewing floss, or excuse me, embroidery floss, or just a piece of scrap yarn. And just get yourself a decent length. And really all you're going to do is the, in the valley between those two stitches. <laughs> so where your beginning of round marker would have went. In this case, I have a six stitch steak. So what I am going to do is, I'm going to zoom in. So hopefully you can see a little bit better. In this case, my steak, you can tell it visually just because this is where I cast on. So it's very easy to tell. Um, I'm basically just going to take this thread and run like a basting stitch up my work. Now you do, it doesn't need to be like every other stitch. Like it can be a good chunk. You're just trying to create a little like, you know, center yellow line essentially for yourself as you're working on your sewing machine so that you can easily stay on track. So, you know, if you are very, if you're not confident at all, make these, you know, only go down and one stitch between. So for example, that's probably not very clear at all <laughs> how I said that. But for example, if you're really like, ah, you can make your stitch long, like this part where the yarn is going to show up, but make your little down stitch real short. So you have just more, you have much smaller tracks where you're not seeing that contrast color. So what I'm going to do is just continue doing that up to the top of the steak. And then um, what I'll be doing is using, using my sewing machine to reinforce one stitch on either side of this. What I typically do is leave, that's as much as we're going to zoom in. What I typically do is leave this stitch alone. I let this be like my margin stitch, right? If you would like to, you can, you know, go into half of it, but definitely the leg on either side of that dividing line, don't stitch over, okay? Because you're gonna cut where this orange th thread is. So you don't wanna accidentally cut your machine reinforcement. Does, certainly, right? So just stay off at least that inside, that left leg in this case. I shouldn't say left leg because that one's got a left leg. But stay off of the leg that's on either side of your cut line, okay? I usually, I often just go a full stitch over because again, I know I have three stitch margin. If I just essentially stitch over this um, stitch right here, if I machine stitch over this one, I've still got an extra stitch here that's, you know, still in the margin, so I'm fine, okay? But, you know, again, just, if nothing else, though, leave the leg that's adjacent to each side of that cut line completely free, because uh, you're going to cut them. So what I'm going to do is sew, machine reinforce these, and then I'll come back to you. We'll talk about which stitch I chose to mach machine reinforce with, and the length and all that stuff, and then we will talk, and then I'll cut, so... All right. Okay, so this is my arm steak. So I used blue thread just so you could see it a little bit, hopefully, a little bit more clearly where I've done my stitching. So there are a few things to talk about when you're doing machine stitching. Um, 
first of all, no matter what stitch you do, you'll probably need to decrease the tension of your thread pretty significantly. Um, really, ideally, if you've knit a swatch for your sweater, this is the perfect time to use that swatch, um, unless you have other plans for it. But this is perfect. If you're going to be machine sewing on your hand knits, get out that swatch, try it out a little bit, especially if you're not super confident. Um, but that's a great way to use your swatch, is to practice this machine stitching on it. Um, that being said, what you want to do universally usually is um, your presser foot pressure can sometimes be a little bit too much um, when you're sending in a knitwear, especially if it's a bulkier knit, like a, a worsted or an Aran weight or bulky weight. Um, I didn't notice the problem so much on this fingering weight, um, but I generally kind of loosen that pressure foot, or that pressure foot pressure, I know that's a presser, sorry, I generally <laughs> ease up on the presser foot pressure. I have a lot of trouble saying presser foot for some reason. So you can do that. Usually it's like a screw on the top of your machine. Sometimes it's a dial. Check your manual. It'll tell you. Um, of course, if you knit on your, if you stitch on your swatch, you don't have any trouble. Cool beans. But usually I do have to um, loosen that up a bit. Okay. Second thing. Okay, third, I already said that you want to decrease or dial down your stitch tension in all, in all likelihood, your thread tension. Don't worry about your bobbin. Don't ever touch your bobbin tension unless something really crazy is happening. Um, but your sewing machine's um, upper thread tension, usually you want to decrease that. Again, you can tell by knitting on the, or sewing on the swatch if you have it. Um, or you can just, you know, be careful and knit or stitch a few stitches, sewing machine stitches at the top and just be aware that you might need to take them out. Okay, so what I've done on this one is I have done a zigzag stitch. Now, I'll be honest with you. This is the first time I've ever done a zigzag stitch um, as my, or maybe it's not, but in my head, it's the first time I've done it. <laughs> um, usually, I just use a straight stitch to do the reinforcing. Um, I adjust the stitch length to make sure that it is smaller than the height of your stitch. So, for example, if your stitch length is this long, all these stitches in between are not going to get reinforced and they're just going to unravel. So you want to make sure that you're catching each stitch at least once. Okay, so make sure that you adjust your stitch length accordingly. Now, typically, for example, if you're sewing on um, like a fabric swatch just to get an idea of your stitch width, length, in this case it's width and length, it will be different than it is on a knit item. Obviously, it, this feeds through much easier than this does. This is going to feed through a bit slower, and therefore your stitch length is going to be compacted. Not your width, but your length. So for example, you can see how tiny this length is. That's okay, but on a woven fabric, it was this one right here. So you can see that it compresses. No, it's this one right here. Sorry, this is the one length. So this is the length that or this is the length that was on a, a woven fabric versus this. Now you'll say, wait a minute, that's not as wide either. You're right, and that is just because I have stretched this to see how much give it would have. Okay, and just naturally feeding it through is going to stretch out your knitwear a bit. So. Typically, that's why when you're doing reinforcing, if you're just doing a straight stitch, you're usually fine because the nature of feeding this fabric through your machine is going to stretch it a bit. And especially for a button band or like the front of a cardigan, whatever you decide to do with it, typically the amount that you're stretching it as you go through the machine is enough so that that... Um, regular straight stitch has enough give built in. Okay, The reason I did a zigzag stitch is because the last time I did a sweater, I steeked a sweater with armholes, um, and I haven't, I don't think I had done one for a while before that, but the last one I did was the uh, Hohi Locatelli sweater, and I steeked the armholes, not suggested in the pattern, I just wanted again to be more efficient in my knitting, and I steeked them with a straight stitch. And the pattern is at a very loose gauge, uh, and it has a decent amount of ease, 
but when I put when I've put the sweater on a couple of times I've noticed that those stitches are cracking you could just hear I mean they're breaking the threads breaking because it did not have enough give for a sleeve you can imagine a sleeve gets under more stretch pressure than just the front of a button band um, typically I mean unless you're like for a kid for a kid I would definitely zigzag it because they're pulling on stuff all the time and but for an adult like I've never had problem with my straight stitching for a um, button band breaking or if or if it has I haven't noticed it but I did definitely notice when I put on my sweater the sleeve I could hear that th that reinforcing thread uh, break so I need to go back and reinforce that before I wear it again <laughs> will I remember who knows but so that's why I decided to do a zigzag here. It's not quite as pretty. One of the nice things about a straight stitch is it usually just falls right in the valley of one of these columns of knitting and you don't even really see it. Obviously this is blue thread. You're seeing it more. <laughs> but that's one of the beautiful things about just doing a straight stitch for reinforcer. So what I had originally thought was, okay, I'll do zigzags for the arm and then I'll do straight stitch for the, the button. But I just decided to do them all zigzag because that was just where I was at, yo. So that's what I do for the machine. Let me make sure, let me check my notes to make sure I didn't think of something else earlier. Let's see, stitch length versus stitch. Oh, and for the zigzag, sorry, forgot what my camera was. For the zigzag, I did use my wise, widest zigzag, but you know, it ju adjust the width of your stitch however you need to. Uh, but this is actually the widest my machine would go. Um, let's see here, stitch length, at least a stitch height, so, oh, the high contrast for your, for your dually do, so you can see, oh, and you can see that that's just, I mean, there's no, like, you could just, like, I can just rip that out now, theoretically. <laughs> oh, see, I've caught it in my reinforcing thread somewhere. I got off track somewhere. Boop. But you can take that out or you can leave it in, whatever, and just cut around it. But it's usually easier to take it out um, so that you're not like battling with it. But if you like it in there just so you can see where you're supposed to stitch, you can just pull it out a little bit at a time. That's an option. Um, using the swatch, tension adjustments, presser foot pressure. Great. I think that's everything. Okay, so now I'm actually going to cut this thing. And I know that this freaks out a lot of people. That's cool. You can be freaked out. No biggie, but it's really not scary, I promise. Um, what I like to do is either use a piece of cardboard or a piece of poster board or foam core or, in this case, a quilting ruler because it's what I had handy. I like to put that inside my knitting because while sticking is not scary to me, like it's not scary to me to cut this, what's scary to me is to accidentally cut the knitting underneath of that because in, we are in a tube. That's the whole point of this, right? So that's what I am always afraid of is cutting the other side, like cutting the other side of the sweater by accident. So this is a good way to do it. You put something in there, um, just right inside your sweater so that, see, just one layer. I'm definitely not going to cut. Make sure you got it nicely flattened out so that you don't have any bubbles that are going to, going to, you know, obviously that's disastrous. Don't, <laughs> um, so yeah. And then really that's all you're going to do. You're going to do that. You want to have a pair of um, not fairly sharp scissors. It doesn't have to be perfect. The only reason you really want sharp scissors is just so you don't accidentally, or not accidentally, but it's just so that you don't stretch your knitting out a lot like as you're sawing with, st with um, scissors. So really I'm just picking. Oh, one thing I forgot to say. Um, when you are, sorry, my lighting has gone crazy because the light has gone behind the tree. The sun's gone behind a tree. Um, when you are sewing, that's where I was going, you do want to do a few back stitches at each end. You, you don't have to, but I just like to do just, I mean, just like two or three is sufficient um, just to help, you know, really reinforce that reinforcing stitching. Um, so that's one thing I forgot to mention. So really all you're going to do is just Again, you see there's two columns of stitches, right? Like, can we zoom in any more? Is it possible? That's a zooming song, if you don't know what that is. All right, kids. See this. So here's my reinforcing. 
See, there's two columns of stitches right there. I'm literally going to cut right through there. Just going to cut these little single stitches. If I accidentally catch this and cut this leg, no big deal. It's going to be okay. But that's one of the reasons you usually, oftentimes you'll see people stick with smaller or shorter scissors. It's just so they don't get too out of control. Because it is easy to just be like, whoop, and then you're like, oh crud, I totally cut into that side. <laughs> but yeah, that's all you're going to do. If you want to stretch it out so that you definitely get right in the middle, then you go for it. But really, it doesn't matter too much. And this is... Not a super wash wool, but it is in no way a hairy or sticky wool. So you'll see it, it's already unraveling, right? See that, already unraveling. But, it's not, I'm pulling on that and it's, like I'm, you can see I'm pulling enough that I'm pulling my knitting. That's not gonna come unraveled. That's, that row of stitches is locked you in. Now, if you're if you're super paranoid or like if it is something like an armhole where you know it's gonna get a lot of use, what you can do is go back and crochet over this if you want to. Like extra reinforce it. If you want to, do another row of zigzag stitches. You know, give it an extra backup if you're really nervous about it. Or if you're using like a, a really slippery super wash wool. Like if this were like a Jameson's or um, uh, a Bartlett wool or Hairsil Designs, like their wools, it would def it would not even want to do that. It would just want to stick to itself. Uh, but this again is a is a smoother worsted spun wool, and so it's like, oh, let's unravel. But again, it's not going to go past that. And you can see I've got quite as much as my stitches will stretch. That zigzag is going pretty much as much as my stitches would stretch. So that's one of the benefits. If I did that with a straight stitch, if I gave it that much yank, that straight stitch is more likely to break um, than a zigzag is. So again, that's why you use zigzags on clothing knits, like interlocks and things like that. Um, that's a good reason to use them on your knitting as well. So really, that's all you gotta do. You just gotta cut that dude open. It's all good. If you've, you know, reinforced well, again, if you're nervous, do another row. It's cool. Nobody's going to decide that that was overkill. It's inside your sweater. Nobody cares. Nobody's going to see it. And if they say something about it, then that's really sad. They need a life. <laughs> so there it is. That's all opened up. Let me zoom out again so that... Do, 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 do. That's the zooming out song. We're zooming out. Ta da da da. So again, you can see it's not pretty, but say okay. And all you're gonna do to finish, what I do is I pick up my stitches and do my bands, or pick up my stitches and do my sleeves. In this case, I've got a show, I've got a seam, seam this shoulder seam closed, but it will automatically roll back because again stockinette always wants to roll. Now if you're steaking anything but stockinette, I don't know why you would steak it. So don't. <laughs> always your steak should be stockinette. Um, so it's automatically going to roll back on itself and so it's already presenting a much tidier appearance. Right? Like it was all rarbiter and then it just wants to, I, I mean I barely massaged it and just wants to roll back on itself. So for a sleeve, all I'll do is pick up and knit my sleeve, and I will just leave this alone. I won't even go back and tack this down. But for example, when I do my front button band, I will. I'll either, you know, you, again, either I would reinforce it with um, a single crochet, which not only reinforces it, but tidies it up, or um, I would just take really a needle and thread. I would not use the... Um, I would not use the yarn because it it's just easier to use a needle and thread. I mean, you could use the yarn, whatever. But I'll just use a needle and thread in all likelihood. <laughs> and just whip stitch this down. So just take a few stitches every once in a while. Um, you know, maybe a stitch every quarter of an inch to a third of an inch. 
um, and just tack this down essentially. You don't want to do like an up and down stitch because you don't want your stitch. Again, if your stitches do come through to the right side, in all likelihood you're not even going to see them because they're going to nestle down in between. But if your stitch is a little bit crooked, it might sh it, it's going to show. So that's why I just kind of use a whip stitch where you're just kind of catching this. Should I just show you what that is? I guess I should. All right, let's pause and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Okay, so I'm back again. What I'm gonna do is just show you very briefly how you would whip stitch. Now I'm gonna do it with a contrasting thread so that hopefully you can see a little bit better. Of course, when you th thread your needle and all that good jazz, you'll want to um, lock it in. And you can't do, then it's not like hand sewing where you can just do a knot. Um, I'm just trying to figure out how to do this so that you can see what I'm doing. Let's zoom in. Maybe. The zooming song, I forgot what it was, but it sounded like zoomy, zoom, 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 zoom. Okay, so here we go. Ow. <laughs> Trying to find where the camera is. Okay, I think we got it. So what you want to do is to, um, well, what I do to, um, lock in my yarn, fix my yarn, knot it, whatever, is I just do a little stitch essentially, like go through one um, yarn bar or two, and then just knot the thread there. Super gracefully, like I'm doing now. <laughs> oh my goodness. Did I even do it? Okay, so whatever. It's knotted in there. Boop, boop, boop. Okay, so when I say that I'm going to whip stitch it down or I'm going to tack it down, what I'm going to do is just catch a leg. Sorry, I'm trying to decide. There we go. The problem is I have light coming in behind the camera, so I'm looking at the camera, which is very difficult when there's light behind it. It's hard for me to see. So I hope that you can see. What I'm doing is catching a leg. There we go, maybe that's better. See, I've caught that leg, and then I'm just gonna catch the stitch that's on the steek, like the border of the steek stitch. And what I'm going to do is just tuck this tail end into this handy little, ta -da! <laughs> this little like placket I'm making essentially. And I'm just going to keep doing that just every few stitches. You don't want to pull it too tight because again, this is knitwear and it's going to stretch um, and you don't want it to pucker. So just when you're pulling your stitches, don't pull them real tight, uh, but you're just going to kind of catch that and then catch the stitch or catch the actual steek stitches. So again, just every once in a while, just catch it and catch it. Whoops, and then you're gonna unthread your needle while people are watching you. And see, all it does is just tack that down a little bit, tidies it up. You can imagine if this were not blue, <laughs> it were like a color closely matching your sweater or even remotely matching it. And if this were also not blue, you would not even know, you would just, it would just look like a nice tidy thing. Uh, and you cannot see it from the correct side, the right side of the fabric. The reason this looks like a little ridge is because this is where the necro shaping is, or the sleeve, the sleeve, I have a needle in my mouth. This is where the sleeve shaping is. <laughs> That's why there's a ridge there. That's just to do with the shaping of the sweater. You can see here where it's further up the sleeve where it's just an even cap. There is no ridge there. Okay. So the next thing I thought I would show you is just if you decided you wanted to do a um, a crocheted reinforcement. Now obviously if you do it, this is not the same method you would use to reinforce the steak before you cut it. Um, but it's pretty similar actually. 
really all you're doing is finding a kind of column of stitches, right? Just let me figure out which ones. Okay, so I'm gonna be working with this ridge right here, essentially. I'm gonna be inserting my needle in these where my fingernail is running, right in there. And just like when you're picking up stitches, there's a hole in there that you can that you would normally pick up your stitch through. You're just gonna put your crochet needle through there, catch it, and just do a piece. I think this is called a single crochet, right? Am I crazy? And then you're just gonna do you're just gonna do that for each stitch. You're just gonna single crochet. You're basically kind of crocheting over this edge that's cut, right? Like you're kind of encasing it in this single crochet in the single crochet. You might not get all of it, like for example, back here you can see this wrong side. What I have done is essentially caught that whole stitched part. You can see those blue stitches inside of my single crochets, but the cut little fringy bits are still out here, okay? But you're basically encasing this column of stitches. This is a column of stitches that I had re reinforced with the sewing machine. I'm in essentially encasing them in a row of single crochets. And as you can imagine, this is quite tidy looking. So when you go to fold it over, like if you pick up your yarn, you know, to do your button band, you don't even really, I mean, it, it looks pretty tidy because when you pick up your, your button band, it's gonna automatically fold it under a bit. And so it's gonna look like that on that side. And so that's the nice thing about the single crochet, but it is, it's a little bulky. It's not bad, but it's a little bulky, especially if, you're, if your sweater is a loose gauge knit, I would say, ugh. but, and it's a little rigid. So for example, in a, in a sleeve, it may not work as well, but I don't know, it's got pretty good stretch. But so that's how you would do a single crochet to kind of cover up or tidy up your steeped stitches. And it does look quite tidy, doesn't it? Uh, and again, when you pick up for your button band or your sleeves or whatever, that's going to be your inside, which looks smashing. And you don't even need to tack that down or anything. It's going to pretty much lay like that, especially if there's any tension on it. So, sorry, that's just my stitch from my... <laughs> so that's an option too. And again, you can use... The single, the crochet method to just, if you don't want to sew your steak, let's say that this is my, you're going to freak out. I'm not cutting this, don't worry. But like, let's just say this is my steak. I can just choose this column of, or you wouldn't choose because it would just be the ones that are on the side of your cutting. But you basically are going to just be single crocheting to encase that column of stitches. So when you go in, you go in, see that? See how the whole knit stitch is on my needle? And then I'm just gonna single crochet. Shazam! Okay, so again, next stitch down. Putting my, then I'm gonna catch it. Okay. Do, 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 do. And you can see like A, if you, again, I understand people not wanting to get their sewing machines out or being freaked out by their sewing machine. I get it. But that's how you, and then again, you do it on the other side and then you cut down the middle. Ta -da! Okay. So, and that's nice because again, if you need to rip it out, just go zippity zoo -da. So yeah, that's all about steaking, okay? And that's all you do. It's really, I promise you, I mean, it's, I guess it's scary, but you know, um, Ann Bud does a class where she does like a mug cozy, which is a great project. She puts, I think she even puts a zipper in it because she's super fabulous. Uh, but you know, like if you're nervous about it, like take some yarn you got laying around that you're not super in love with or that's just in your scrap bin and knit yourself a tube. Just knit a tube and do some practice. I mean, you're, you'll, it'll, you may find that it is actually scary for you. That's cool. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with you if you find it to be scary, but at least you'll know, right? So 
that's my recommendation to you. And I think that's all you really need to know. Like, that's it, dudes. Reinforce. Reinforce. Um, as a recap, <laughs> when you're sewing your steak, prepare. Do your little stitch down the middle to make life easier. Really, trust me, even when you're an experienced sewist, it is so easy to get off track. And before you know it, your steak stitches is way over here and it's a nightmare. So even if you're experienced, put in your little guide, okay? Your sewing machine settings. In this case, I used a zigzag. I used the widest I had available. And I actually used a stitch length of one, which is, but again, <laughs> it changes on knits versus um, wovens. So practice on your woven just to make sure you understand what your machine is doing, but understand that it's going to look different on the knits. Um, but so you'll need to change. So get your stitch length and your stitch width how you want them. You'll need to loosen your tension in all likelihood, your upper thread tension. Just dial it down. It's, no, it's not an exact science, but in all likelihood, you'll need to dial it down. And then if you find that your machine doesn't seem to want to pull the, th the, the um, knit through, it might be that your presser foot is too strong. It's pressing down too hard. So you can decrease the pressure on your presser foot. And that is another thing you might want to do when knitting, when sewing knitwear. And then, yeah, I think that's all. Ta-da! So hopefully I'll have this all done and I can show you next time. But until then, I hope you have happy steaking. Bye.